Sorry, I made slides for four to three, and uh, a bit weird now. Um, that's the first time I'm seeing a good projector in my life, so sorry. Uh, I hope you were listening to Andrew's talk because that seems like I'm continuing somewhat what he said or something like that. Anyway, we will see. Uh, I've been thinking quite a bit how to structure this talk. And in the end, I settled up for uh, just uh, a story about different things which uh, worked for us while we were fixing up a, a weird project. Let's say it like that. Mm, so what works for us and what doesn't. Uh, what's actually Modna Casta? It's, an, it's, it's a shop. Uh, it was it's a seven, almost seven years old right now, like six and a half or something like that. It's the largest uh, clothing site in Ukraine. Uh, fortunately, we are much more open about our numbers, so I will show some. Uh, you can actually learn what's going on. And uh, well, I suspect that Event Bright is much much bigger, especially given hundreds of engineers, because we have like four people writing backend. <laughs> so that's a bit different. Anyway, uh, let's start. Uh, it all starts in January 2015 when I came to Modna Casta, and uh, the code base was started in. That's a tale I heard parts of it, and it seems that code base was started in, in Australia in 2006, and then somehow came to Turkey, and then was in Ukraine. And it was different teams writing it, and. Uh, it was more than 1,000 lines of Python, which was a lot for, for engineers, <laughs> as you can imagine. And it was a drag on business. It was a real problem. It was hard to improve. It didn't perform. It was hard to fix. Amount of support requests was just astounding. All, everyone was just fixing problems and uh, fighting with fires. And uh, Bodna Casta did a um, Black Friday sale. Uh, in 2014, and it was a real commercial success. It was the biggest, uh, the best event in Ukraine by uh, relative growth of the site. So it's like probably Rosyatka is much bigger, but whatever. Uh, I mean, I don't care. Uh, but still, it was it was a lots of downtime, right? Three hours of downtime or something like that, or four hours. Uh, they just so it works like that. Um, we have this uh, campaigns which started. Um, some, well, at some time, right? At 8 o'clock or at 12 o'clock or something like that. At, at tw tw 8 o'clock in the evening, a uh, few new campaigns started. A lot of people came to the site and it just crashed and was dead until the midnight. And then uh, we've spent whole 2015 fixing stuff, optimizing uh, site, optimizing queries. And Black Friday 2015 was again a commercial success. And because of one mistake, we had a three hours of downtime in the evening. Because I mean, that's how it works, right? <laughs> you just the thing is, you can't you can't uh, prepare yourself for the Black Friday. You just have to experience it be before you understand what's going on there. It just it's like it is. All the new people which came in 2016 and didn't see the Black Friday 2015 didn't expect it to be like that. Anyway, so how do you fix this stuff? I mean, everything is bad. You have no freaking idea how it works. There is no architecture. Nobody left who can tell you what, why the decisions were made. And uh, yeah, it did 5 RPS on my laptop, which is a bit lower than I would love to, you know. Um, 2015, November 2015, we had, we had our peak at probably 2,000 RPS. And it was 18 servers with 50 per processes of Django on each server, and a database with 256 gigabytes of memory. And uh, yeah, I mean, it just didn't survive. So we decided to rewrite it. Be there's a lot of ways to fix. You could, uh, you, I guess, you could just continue fixing that. But after 10 months, I was like, yeah, whatever. It just, it's not working for us. And how do you rewrite? Well, you just you just do it, right? You just do it bit by bit. You, 
I mean, you spend time on that, and uh, of course, you're updating all the stuff so that it doesn't, mm, you know, conflict, and then, well, the rewrite happens. And you, well, you may take away, you shouldn't be too fast because that's going to be painful. And uh, here's the story of things that actually worked out really well. We did the rewrite page by page. So we just decided somewhere early, 2015 actually, that rewrite is needed and uh, started doing this stuff in parallel. And in November, we tried, and the new site died in flames. And not because of, our, well, because of our mistake, but we just thought that Elasticsearch is a good thingy, and it's not. I'll tell you about that. And then in February, we finally launched a new main page, and then just bit by bit, we replaced almost whole site in December. And right now, we have <coughs> Right now, we have only um, a user profile, user profile running on the old code. And Black Friday 2016 was OK. We were running on eight servers, and the database load was like 30%. And you know, it was OK. Sorry? No, we didn't have any downtime in 2016. And I was actually not present on, in the, on the work that Friday, and it was still OK, <laughs> which made me pretty happy. It was around 3,000 uh, requests per second, so you can understand what's going on there. Anyway, we did a single page application. That's a weird decision for a shop because uh, a shop is mostly informational size, right? It's closer to the wiki than to the um, application. Um, but single page applications provide you a few nice properties, and the main of them uh, is that you don't request as much data on every page change because the footer is there and header is there. You don't need to download data about campaigns because it was downloaded in first request and stuff like that. So you just and you separate your front end code and back end code and you can just spend a lot of time perfecting single query which is bad instead of fixing all the menu queries. Of course the problem is, is that Initial load is slower. It's actually still slower for us than it was on old side, despite uh, serving right now a single uh, JavaScript and having hundreds of jQuery plugins before that. And you have to implement server-side rendering, of course, because uh, mobile clients will see blank page for a long, long time, especially Android, where JavaScript sucks and Chrome is not really Chrome. And everybody buys phone for 100 bucks, and it doesn't wor really work. But anyway, we just did server-side rendering. You just take Node.js, and uh, you get, well, just render your current page to string, and then you inject in some template with head and uh, JavaScript and stuff like that. And the actual rendering works like that. You just try to render your you know, site. And it makes some requests to server, initiates some requests to server because they are asynchronous. You just wait for them to end, and then you render second time with all the data being queried in memory, and that's your site. And does it really work? Well, you manage a pool of Node.js processes because uh, I mean, they just single own, single, single node render the site in roughly 300 milliseconds. So that's, you know, not really fast. So you have a lot of nodes, but whatever, we have a lot of servers. And then, then you go through a HTTP API, which is, of course, a nice overhead on top of that, right? And yeah, you render everything twice. So, I mean, you're burning CPUs. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm greedy about that. So we are not really happy, of course. It just sucks. So what we did, uh, fortunately, I went to New York to a closure conch in 2015, and there was a guy called Aaron Ronner, or I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but it's, it's a bit hard. But uh, he just invented a nice thingy. You didn't really expect we were rewriting this in Python, right? So we didn't edit in closure, and uh, the 
uh, backend is in closure and frontend is in closure scripts. And the closure in release, which came out in 2015, made a nice thing here. They, so you have the CLJ files which are executed on server, or CLJS which are executed on client. Sorry. Uh, or CLJC, which are executed everywhere. So it's like a common code where you have code which is, uh, can be executed uh, there, here and there. You can just write it like a common thingy and required. So it's code sharing between client and, and server, which is also nice. So you have this code which uh, makes a React component uh, which will render and div and a span. I guess it's pretty understandable despite uh, parentheses being on the wrong side. But anyway, it just returns a React client on the ser React component on the server, and then on the on the client, and then on the server, the same code just returns you a, a string, which is wraps span in a div, and that's all. So you can have in process uh, server side rendering of your client code right in JVM, which is pretty fast. It was. It was, I don't know, like 80 milliseconds for a main page or something like that. We almost four times faster than Node.js. So in this case, we were much more happier. And uh, there is no Node.js in my life, which makes me really happy. I mean, that's just the, um, the best. And here we are coming to talk about hard stuff. Uh, this day is about databases, I guess. We're going to talk about data. We have this. Uh, that's my favorite story about all the uh, weird things inside our project, the metadata payers. Uh, it's, uh, it's a nice name, right, metadata payer. I mean, it's a really nice name. And it's a benchmark inside our, our team uh, of a disaster. Like, is this as bad as metadata pairs? Well, not, not really. I mean, it's like half of metadata pairs. And then it's an, it's an actually pretty okay -ish design uh, went horribly wrong. So you have this metadata pair, which at the, that's actually a full, full database schema. So you have this metadata pair, which refers a product and referring the value and the key. And the key and value are strings. And that's just because you are trying to save some space because, of course, uh, values can repeat, so you can encode them in table, and keys can repeat, so you can encode them in table. And uh, let's actually look what the keys are. We ha had only six keys, and that is like volume and empty string and a description and number, and actually two sizes, right? But the thing is, you don't see that because Monaco is good, but this uh, R is actually P, so it's Pazmir, <laughs> and that is Razmir. Which is, I mean, great. And you see, well, nobody uses this stuff. It's only 15 million of those. Uh, so it's, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I actually didn't understand what's going on there for four months or something like that. It was until April I understood what's going on. And then you have to, well, so you, you, store, you store size of a product. You have a product and it has a few sizes and you store sizes in, uh, in the key value store, but you make the ID of this key value store your ID for the size. And then you have, well, the size has a stock, like five sizes, five L uh, t-shirts. And how do you store that? Well, you make a table called metadata pair stock, and it has stock count, count of stock and count of sold items. But then you don't make a foreign key to the metadata pair. You just make a many to many table, because of course you can have many stocks. Actually, you can't. And that is for every metadata pair stock, there is only metadata pair stock, metadata pair whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's actually, you know, because that, that was Django, it's not the whole name. It's product metadata pair stock metadata pairs, actually, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing. But then you can add that to your basket so you can buy that. And how do you do that? Well, you have basket item and the foreign key to the metadata pair, right? Well, not really. You have basket item with foreign key to product and then many to many table to metadata pair. And is that called uh, basket, basket item, metadata pairs? Uh, I mean, uh, there were like 
25 million records in this table, and uh, yeah, whatever. Are there any problems? Well, you'd make 22 queries to database to request single size. So you take product, <laughs> and then 22 queries to database. But then, well, what if you have five sizes? Well, you make 110 queries, right? And uh, you, what, I mean, like, just guess the shit. I mean, what? Yeah. But the thing is, uh, well, you want to show user that if he added a uh, some size to his basket and it's not available, well, it's not available for everyone, but it's available for his user. So you make query cache per user. So, I mean, why do you cache that at all? It's just, well, I mean, it just it destroyed the database with load. It just, it was, at some point we had a sale, it was January or February of 2016, and we had 600 people on site and it just crashed because of this shit. Uh, so we replaced all this madness with this single table which refers product, basket, well, referred by basket, has size, stock, and sold, and yeah, well, we were happy. No many-to-many -many relations, a single join, uh, to a single query to get a product, I mean, Julio. So that was, was all made possible by Postgres. It made the worst design ever possible. But the, I mean, I love it because there is no way we could get out of this uh, hole if we were not using a relational DBMS, right? I mean, just imagine using Mongo for that. <laughs> Mongo, no GS. I mean, I would love, but I was just happy. Uh, but then another thing that worked. Uh, you remember we were not writing, rewriting this in Python, right? So yeah, we just. Digits the ORM, and that turned out to be pretty great because, well, ORMs always overfetch data because people are lazy and they just say, I want a model, and you get a lot of data you don't really need. And then, well, I, I really love this second bullet. I mean, like implicit behavior complicates understanding. And it's a few hard words <laughs> mashed together, but it, it really is like that. It's just so many stuff going under the, you know, under the hood of ORM that you just can't understand what will happen. And uh, people who write Django save methods, you should just burn hell. And then ORM is actually inflexible. They make you, uh, they they make it hard to write queries which are optimal. And they're um, slow, and that is a weird point. But I mean, ORM it by itself is slow. Junk ORM is like slowish, but not really just really slow. But SQL Alchemy is the one that's slow. I just remember it's a bit better now than it was before. But I remember how I made. A, I was working at uh, working at ticketing ticketing company which sold the tickets for events and what that was not even bright, and we had this uh, mm, benchmark called ticker, tickets per second how many tickets we can sell per second and we had this load testing tool and the current figure was five tickets per second it, it's a lot of requests to buy a ticket like I don't know ten fifteen whatever but five tickets per second. And I was um, given a task to improve this performance. And I was looking for fire, and I don't know what to do. Everything is in SQL Alchemy. Like 80% of time spent in SQL Alchemy. And I was like, OK, let's upgrade it from 0 06, 0 06 to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 0 06 to 0 07. And uh, we improved the, on the tickets per second to eight, sticker per, eight ticker, tickets per second. And they told when they upgraded to SQL Alchemy uh, 0.9, it was also improved. And it kept improving. But I mean, SQL Alchemy is just a lot of Python code. And the rule of writing Python is that you shouldn't write Python. Because every should, every, everything should be spent in C code, you know? Like, how do you optimize a Python application? You remo remove a lot of code, and it becomes much faster. And then ORMs are prone to your errors. I mean, it's really easy to not notice how you make uh, one plus and, and requests, right? Like 110 requests for metadata pairs. It looked really easy on the surface, like you just 
give me all the sizes, 110 requests to the database and logs. OK, but I don't know that. I, it's just not showing me that. And they actually prevent, which is the worst thing about the RMs, they prevent people from understanding how the data is laid out in the database. Because they make all the nice stuff on the top, and uh, people are used to like firing up a Python shell. Let's take this model. Let's take this object, let's take this object, let's take a relation. And they don't really know what's going under the hood. They don't really know how the data is laid out. And not understanding how your data is laid out is asking for disaster if you ever get uh, problems in production. Uh, the only thing which is good about ORMs is that they allow for composition. Because if you write your queries in strings, you're, I mean, it's hard to compose strings. String concatenation is, is a hard thingy. So, but we were using a library called HanuSQL, which, HanuSQL, which allows us to write queries as a regular closure map. You, I mean, well, it's like Python dictionary, right? You can understand what's going on here. You just select a list of fields from a list of tables with some. Uh, where, whatever, I don't know the words for that. But I mean, you can compose those maps. You can add uh, more thingies. If you w want a helper, it's just a simple function to take in a dictionary in some parameters. It's pretty good. Uh, so that's all about Postgres and ORMs. And we're coming back to the my beloved uh, data store. Uh, Elasticsearch is a nice, nice um, store which is used for search and faceted filter filtering. And there is no alternatives because Solar is actually the same thing under the hood. And Sphinx doesn't really make, doesn't really make faceted filtration properly. And everything else j just costs a lot of money. So you, you're using Elasticsearch because you have no alternatives. And uh, when we first uh, uh, started that back in November 2015, first time tried to put that in production, production, it just stopped answering in three seconds because, I mean, three nodes are not enough to handle whatever load we put it uh, under. And uh, we didn't really understand that it's dead for, for a few minutes because it was showing that it's okay. It was not eating CPU, it was not eating memory, and it was not replying to a seek kill. And we actually restarted servers to kill it. Uh, and people around, I was asking for advice what to do. Maybe we laid data, laid out data wrong, or maybe something else. And they were just keeping, you're asking for too much. Don't do aggregations, put more servers. And I mean, we're, despite having some servers, uh, we're a pretty small company, and we're not really fond on spending a lot of money. So. Yeah, I was thinking, how do, do you solve that? And in Postgres, you just use explain, and it explains you what to do. And in Elasticsearch, there is some explain, which gives you fi 50 kilobytes JSON. And there is no tool to show you what the, what the data is in JSON. I mean, uh, let's not swear there, right? Uh, so we what we did? I actually invented this little uh, cheat, which, so we have this um, event that the campaign with products is published on the site. It's, it's there. It's not visible to people, but it's there already. It's made in content preparation system, so it's published. We send an event, and then some processor catches this, ev this event, goes to Elasticsearch, and agree aggregates all the aggregates, puts them in Cassandra, then goes through the first uh, layer of uh, queries and uh, takes all the aggregates and puts them in Cassandra. And the application, so the Cassandra is our caching layer. Uh, I can probably even show you. Uh, no, I, I don't have a Wi-Fi here, so I'm sorry. Anyway, so we just cache fir first two layers, and the amount of requests to Elasticsearch dropped like tenfold or something like that. Which is, I mean, now it survives. We have four nodes now because we have a bigger load, but whatever, four nodes are enough for now. And uh, how do you send an event? Well, you have to have some messaging system. We had RabbitMQ, which crashed for us every month. 
So we tried out Kafka. And it turned out to be like, I mean, it's probably my second favorite, 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 whatever, tool in after Postgres. It's just, it's, it is crazy fast. It has this beautiful concept of topics and groups, which is orthogonal. There is no real stuff from RabbitMQ with acknowledge, pub, sub, whatever. You just make from, from this design with topics, topics, topics and groups, you can make whatever you want. You want a pub sub, a one-to-one, -one, whatever, whatever you need. It actually about crazy fast. At some point, we made a mistake and started writing around five, six thousand uh, messages in second to Kafka. And we noticed that, noticed that because I was looking at the offset monitor and uh, when somewhere came back in two hours, did a reload, and my offset increased from millions to hundreds of millions. And I was like, what's going on there? I'm not, I'm not very sure. Uh, the servers were not under load. Uh, the, I mean, Kafka was not eating CPU, was not eating memory. There was nothing going on, like literally nothing. And it just handled the 5,000 messages a second, which is 10 times more than, than, than we need right now. So we are pretty safe here. And uh, it replaced, for us, it replaced all the custom APIs. You, you remember that slide uh, which Andrew showed you about 10 servers each talking to each other. Well, that's what, that, that's what we had, actually. We had the site talking to pre-production, talking to ADNS, talking to site, everybody's to everybody, there is an email servers. We actually had 10 email servers, so everybody's talking to one of them if you don't have an email. Uh, well, if, you, if the user didn't receive an email, you don't really know what go what's going on because, well, who did that? Who knows? Uh, and we replaced that with Kafka, and it actually became just a central, central um, place for us to exchange messages. And the most beautiful th thing about that is that we started doing a, an inter interface for suppliers so we could show them some analytics so they would stop calling our, our buyers every half an hour during Black Friday asking how's my, you know, stuff selling. And so the, the hub. And we wrote it without making any change to any system in place. It just uh, read messages from existing Kafka streams. It's just like, whatever, it just works. And there is also Onyx, which I also love. It's our salary, actually. It's a, it's a masterless distributed event stream framework, and I actually removed half of buzzwords from the description. Uh, um, well, it is, but it's just uh, hot new shit right now, so all those words sound weird, right? Uh, but the thing is, it's a, it's a replacement for Apache Spark or uh, Storm or Flink or Kafka Streams or um, hundreds of them. Uh, the main property of Onyx is that you describes, describe all your data flows with, with data. You're, so you have this concept of a task, which is des described with a closure dictionary, and then you have concept of a job, which is um, made up by tasks, and you just describe that you take this data here and pass it to this function and to this function and then right here. And we are doing all stuff in there. We're sending emails, we generate cache, we uh, publish data through that. And uh, the nice property is that all your, those processing functions or readers or writers are pure in that they don't have side effects. So what you can do, we had this problem on Hello in 2016. We were an hour and a half late on sending emails. So you made an order, and uh, in almost two hours you receive like, thank you for making an order, we, are, we, we love you. And that was, uh, that was weird, but we expected Black Friday to be much worse. So we wrote this email sender in Onyx, put it in there, and it, it was faster. We were like, okay, but uh, I mean, whatever, it's just a bit faster, like f maybe twice faster, it's not enough. So the Onyx has this property for each task, say in peer count, which is how many threads uh, this task is assigned to. And I just increased it to 10, and uh, I mean, 
A few days ago, uh, we had a problem where we had 40,000 emails not sent yet, and it was like maybe five minutes or something like that to send all of them. So it makes it makes scaling much easier. We just run a new server, put it there, and it synchronizes itself through Zookeeper, and we had Zookeeper because we had Kafka, and you were like you're doing almost nothing. You, your DevOps are going to struggle, of course, because the Keeper Kafka and stuff is hard, but developers are going to be f happy. And uh, yeah, the, the uh, I don't know, the interesting part. <laughs> uh, this, I mean, that is the most impo important slide of this talk. Uh, functional program is, of course, nice. It's just, I mean, it feels, uh, feels warm and fuzzy and stuff, and I mean, functional programming. But functional programming is a okay cache. I mean, immutable data is where, is where your life is. Because immutable data, the main property of how immutable data is, I mean, you can't just assign something to a dictionary. You can just generate a new dictionary with data being updated there, right? And the immutable data is nice is that it just removes a whole class of problems like, I don't know. So you have those different bugs, and they arise from different conditions. And uh, immutable data makes half of the cases unavailable to you. It's just you can't make those errors anymore. Well, you can, of course. You can just take Java reflection, or you can write a byte to memory, and everything will die in hell. But you're not doing that, so you're pretty safe. I mean, and. I mean, it's, it's just hard to describe how much better it is. I actually tried out Clojure back in whatever dark ages uh, because of all those, because of Clojure script, actually. Because you can write Lisp on, in browser. I mean, that's, that's just a dream. But then Clojure has a lot of, lots of nice properties, good libraries, great community. But the main reason I'm, I'm in love is the immutable data. It just makes your life simpler. It's just, it's, you, you, if, you rem, if you ever wrote React and remember the life before that, like writing jQuery and then switching to React, you can imagine how simpler life becomes. Uh, the, the technologies, um, why do we actually write code in Clojure or Python, not in Assembler? Because the, the newer technologies are striving to make, your, make you li write better programs. And what is a better program? It's a program which is more correct, uh, which fails less. And the immutable data makes it much easier to do. And then the closure itself. Uh, it's really expressive. It's the simplest language you can use uh, practically right now. It's a small language. It's, Still expressive, fast because I am in audit, like in talking to a Python conference, right? So its closure is really, really fast. I mean, I, I wouldn't put this bullet on a Java conference because its closure is really slow, but actually it's really fast. So the, the community is crazy good. It's the best community. I, I'm sorry, guys, but the closure community is better than you. <laughs> I mean, the the thing is, sorry, but the thing is that. Closure is a bit weird. You, 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 if you remember the Paul Graham's uh, writings, he wrote 15 years ago that Python is weird because uh, Python is only written by guys who want to do that. So the average level of Python programmers is much higher than average level of um, like Java or C++ programmers. So that is what's happening with Closure. The people who want to write Closure are usually like already know how to write software. So the average level is just a bit higher. And because of that, um, library quality is higher. And you can use all those Java stuff written for 100 years, or I don't know, million, billion years, whatever they write it for. And it's actually a pro functional language, right? So that's, that makes you write code differently. And yeah, hot code reload. I'll tell you a, bit, a little bit later on. Uh, and you have this thing called read-eval print loop. Which you, like, you have that in Python, but you didn't really have it. We're not doing that in Python. 
So what you do, you can, your process application process starts up and op opens a port and listens for a connection from your editor. So you can connect uh, your editor there and explore your current state of the system. You can update a function. You can experiment with new code in the running process. It's not like you're uh, firing up a Python shell, you write some code, and then you just copy paste it. And then, well, I, I hate the, 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 you know, weird selection uh, in terminal, which is, how do you call it? It's a vertical selection because of those triangles are uh, getting in the way. But, I mean, look. It's, it's a bit better. Actually, I'm wondering why nobody does it in Python, because it was, I, I really remember that it was, it was in Twisted back in 2008. Why nobody else did that, I'm not exactly sure. But it should be, should be. Anyway, so, and another thing that which worked well for us is monitoring. <laughs> we had nothing, and we started doing some, and it's pretty nice <laughs> to know what's going on. I mean, it's, it's, it's an eye-opening experience, I would say. <laughs> so we did the, the Riemann plus influx or influx plus Grafana. And why Riemann? Because, well, because influx is written in Go, and who wants to write to that uh, disgusting stuff, right? And Riemann is in enclosure, so we're writing in there. Actually, the uh, issue is that Influx died under load multiple times for us. <laughs> yeah, so we put the Riemann in front of uh, Influx, and it's, uh, it's much better now. Also, Influx in, improved in recent times, but I don't really care. I, what Riemann, uh, you know, the thing is, it's a, it's a bit funny. So you take this uh, lean language which doesn't eat memory and is really fast, uh, how do you call it, systems programming language, and write a database in it, and uh, you start, uh, and you put then uh, front-end written in uh, dynamic programming language on the memory hog, which is JVM, and then on Black Friday, uh, your Riemann eats four gigabytes of CPU, and writes to Riemann, which is 56 gigabytes of CPU and eight cores of uh, Intel Xeon. And it's pretty amazing to look. It's just the guy who writes Riemann. It's Afir, which wrote Jepson test suite. So you can imagine he's a bit better than Influx teams that write in network services. But anyway, so we have this dashboard, and the, I you know, removed uh, commercial data. But you can look. That is, I don't know. It is uh, yesterday's day, 7 p.m. or something, whatever. And uh, we have we had some people online and some requests are going on. And we have uh, errors in Sentry, mostly in JavaScript, because Opera came probably, uh, yeah, like that. Um, so it actually too takes, takes a long time to make a, a useful dashboard. We don't have a useful dashboard yet. We have this one and another one, and we're just switching between them from time to time. But it get, gets better from, gets better. Then there is a mini profiler. It's a bit like Django debug toolbar, but for everyone. Um, you can mark your code, and then it takes and shows you, and it shows you where you made, made uh, 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 queries. And there is three queries to Postgres, which looks uh, suspiciously similar, so it says you have duplicates, and then it tracks client stuff as well, and then you just like you know, it 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 actually helps you to catch problems in production as well. We have it running for production for developers, and sometimes we catch some problems. And what was really bad? I mean, the worst thing is when you're changing stuff too fast. Uh, once upon a time, I fixed, I fixed the reservation system, which was broken. I fixed it in two hours, and then we spent three weeks fixing that. <laughs> so you know, move slowly. It is just, I mean, I didn't really sleep those three weeks. It was hard. I'm, I'm happy that my child was born after that, <laughs> because in that other case, I would just be dead. And then fixing old code, it just doesn't work for me. I mean, I, I mean, never, never did. You can, if it's sufficiently rotten, you just learn use cases, write a new one, and uh, throw out this shit. It, I mean, just piece by piece, you, you have to do that. And the results of all this stuff. I mean, 
The best result, of course, is that we have much less bugs, we have much less problems, we sleep better, our DevOps are less mean, and stuff like that. But I can show you there is no real numbers about that, right? I can show you like uh, uh, Dima is 15% uh, happier than uh, this month a year ago. It's just, uh, just, I mean, I didn't start collecting that yet. Uh, but I can show you some performance numbers. And we have this. Um, I actually ha can show you a funny thingy. Uh, you just which 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 button? To? Oh, okay. So uh, there is a API request time and there is UI request time. Median, median. It's uh, we have another dashboard with 99th percentile, and I'm showing you because I'm I am ashamed. Uh, and there is a Django median request time. So you can uh, see how it improved, right? We have this 74. Well, it's actually flaws from time to time be because of mm, different data, but it's around 80 milliseconds. And the API is around 18 milliseconds mean request time. And uh, we had, we had, well, I told you, right, we had, we switched from 18 servers to 8 servers, and those 8 servers are 8 servers because our devel DevOps are, well, they don't believe developers, so they put a bit more, I, I guess we could survive with 3 or 4. Right now, with, with current load, because it's, it's, you know, it's print, so nobody buys stuff, uh, we could survive with just a single server. And the nice thing of all that is that uh, we didn't shard our database. We didn't partition our database. We just fixed our queries, and uh, it was like 25% load uh, on Black Friday on the same database. Yeah, just like we just bought, we spent a bit of time on that, but we've bought another two years of not having to worry about database. So it's pretty cheap. Uh, because I mean, sharding and partitioning is not cheap. It's 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 you have hundreds of engineers to cope with that, or you can have four and uh, you know, single Postgres, and then amounts of code. Is this is this hard to compare? Uh, of course, because the things they do are different and stuff like that. But our API is six hundred six thousand lines of code, which is which is, I mean. I'm jealous of, my fa of myself here. Uh, Frontend is, of course, bigger because they write in everything in BAM with a lot of classes and shit and uh, whatever. I mean, that's Frontend. They, they are responsible for that. Uh, so what is the, I mean, I'm not giving you any advice. You're, uh, you're a master of your own life, and you can do whatever you want. You can. Uh, Whatever you can, whatever. Uh, but but we did the right and turned out to be pretty good. It took a lot of time, but right now things are better and we're almost done. So we're happy about that. And you should use immutable data. That's my only advice: use immutable data. At least learn what it is, so you can suffer your daily life knowing that you're not using that. Thank you a lot. Hello, I have a question about your database. When you resolved your problem with database structure, um, you mentioned that you like Mongo. And I don't. <laughs> okay, but uh, mm, uh, did you look at uh, uh, JSON, JSON uh, field in Postgres? JSON well, before? we're using JSON field in Postgres, of course. So we have those characteristics of a product, which is like affiliation uh, mail or kind uh, I don't know, group is a um, dress and kind is a summer dress, something like that. And we're putting that in JSON. But of course, we're putting in JSON all the stuff, only stuff we are not querying for because yeah, it's just storage. You can, you can query it, but we're not doing that usually. It just, I mean, you can, whatever. <laughs> It's actually, uh, you know, the problem with the JSON field. It's not like it's not constrained by schema, and schemaless is a, it's not a real thing. It's just your schema is weird and you're not knowing it. So having the schema is better. Plus, if you have a schema, you can alter it. 
So you can say, like, for repositories, please change my data, which we did with metadata payers, uh, stock basket item. And uh, it does that, and you don't, know, don't need to write um, a thing in Python which processes like 10,000 times per time and updating it for 500 days. It's just better. So, yeah. Thank you. Hi, it's me. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, as I know, uh, you said that the big plus, you can share components between front-end and back-end enclosure, but as I know, uh, in JS you can do, do it. Yeah. And uh, uh, the second question is about, I mean, you visit the conference, you like Clojure Script, but was your developers happy with uh, having Clojure in your project? Okay, so it's easier. here is one guy sitting there, so you can ask him. But then uh, uh, all of my front-end developers were just verstalchiki. <laughs> How do you call that in English? I don't know. Mm, I mean, they were okay, but they were just juniors. Anyway, so you understand what Verstalchik is, right? <laughs> uh, so I just told them, here's your template in system, please like write templates. And they're like, okay. I mean, I'm used to Django, I'm used to PHP, so that is a new template in system. And day by day, they just learned how to use if, how to use for. And that's it. I mean, they're pretty happy about that. They're okay, actually, about that. There is one guy who knew how to connect a jQuery plugin. So he constantly jokes, I would do that in, pos in jQuery in five minutes. And I mean, could he? Whatever. And about server side, guys? Well, I mean, it, it's how you. Sorry? Well, yeah, I mean, you just tell them how good it is, and they're like, wow, that's pretty good. Actually, just try it, and you will, like, can we switch to closure, please? I mean, and everybody else would be, I mean, I'm mean, happy. It's Lisp with all the parentheses. I don't know. I mean, you can ask them, but to me, they seem pretty happy. Okay, thank you very much.